Taryn Trott. I work in the emergency department at the University of Kentucky as well as the medical ICU. And now if you know me, there's one thing I love and that's the bougie. I've had this long standing infatuation with the bougie and have been a pretty vocal advocate. So like someone walks in the room and they're holding out bougie and I'm like, yes, you there with the bougie, come here with that. So much that I still remember my first bougie intubation or necessary bougie intubation, I should say. I was on my rural ER rotation as a second year resident in uh, rural Kentucky and the attending physician had stepped out for a meeting and that was exactly when a patient got dropped off in a respiratory extremis complete with angioedema. And I remember like walking away from that intubation shaking, thinking, had I not successfully used that bougie, that patient was donezo. And of course, there's so many reasons to love the bougie. We know that its slim profile allows for good visualization as we approach the glottis. It allows for slim or smaller endotracheal tubes to be passed over. Its coup de tip lets us reach those anterior airways or maybe perhaps when we can't even see the glottis and we have a grade four view. And of course, it's malleable, allowing us to really bend or fix the bougie to our patient's airway needs. It also provides a tactile response. We can feel those tracheal rings, and that's something that you can definitely get good at and um, appreciate the more you use a bougie. And we get this hold up again, confirming maybe a grade four intubation when we reach the length of the bougie in the brachial um, in the main stems. We also use it for all, all sorts of other things, right? We use it for tube exchanges. We use it for uh, trach exchanges. I know those two have been very valuable for me. We can do selective main stem intubations by maybe twisting the bougie tip and directing towards the main stem. I've found this actually particularly useful. A bougie assisted chest tube in some of our more obese patients can be really useful for when you get in that chest, you can hold your tract open with the bougie and shuttle a chest tube over. That is amazingly useful when you need it. And of course, we can't forget our finger scalpel bougie technique. So, despite the fact that I always had this infatuation with the bougie, you know, there wasn't much data to support it until 2017. Now, granted, this was a retrospective review out of uh, Hennepin County and Brian Driver's first study that showed a pretty significant first pass success, 95 versus 86%. But granted, this was retrospective single study. So I was pretty stoked when I saw this study come out in JAMA, May of 2018. This was a super important study. And what they did was a randomization of endotracheal tube versus and stylet versus bougie in ED intubations. And they had a robust number of patients. And really important, they actually had 380 patients with predefined difficult characteristics, right? Ob obesity, cervical neck immobilization, et cetera. And so it was phenomenal. Their first, their primary outcome, first pass success in this whole group of patients with the bougie was 99% versus 92. And this is like outstanding. Most benchmark studies, when you look at registry data, are somewhere between 80 and 84%. So 99% was absolutely crushing it. And then when they looked at first pass success with patients with predefined difficult airways, that was 96 versus 82, an even bigger margin. And of course, validating the value of bougie in our difficult airway, something that I was already like, yeah, that's definitely what I'm using the bougie. So a couple other things that they found is that first pass success without hypoxemia, less than 80%, was significantly better with the bougie. And of course, we saw validation in our poor airways, either things like cervical immobilization, or as we saw the grade of the cormac Leanne view get worse, we saw the bougie again outperform. So yeah, basically this was just checking all my boxes for kind of this preconceived notion that the bougie was already a badass. So everything just lined up for me. And it was at this point that, you know, I was even, I even like reached out to Brian Driver and I'm like, Dr. Driver, I think your study is amazing. Props to you. Um, and it was, I, I was actually lecturing on this a lot and I was lecturing to ERs, ICU, and even a couple of invited lectures about the promise of the bougie, you know, and I was essentially saying it was just a matter of time before the bougie becomes standard of care. 
perfect. So then we enter in 2021, about nine months ago now, and we have the bougie trial. And this was going to be it. This was like the slam dunk. This is what we need to change standard of care in critically air, ill airways. It was prospective, multi-center ERs and ICUs, and again, randomizing the endotracheal tube versus stylet. So I sat down, I grabbed my favorite bougie, a cup of coffee, and I'm reading through it, I'm reading through it, I'm looking through the data, and uh, you know, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to see what I want to see, and I'm not seeing it. So what they found was primary outcome and first pass success in all patients was 84, 80% with the bougie and 83% without the bougie. And importantly, that was not a statistically significant difference. So there was no difference when randomizing to all these operator hands, whether or not the bougie improved first pass success. And then there was all this narrative, you know, all, I mean, I wasn't the only one, of course, there was a lot of big bougie fans and advocates, and I'm not saying I'm not now, but there was all this narrative about, well, what about this and what about that? And basically most of these were refuted, right? So we said the bougie always excelled when you can't see the glottis, you have these grade four views. And in this study, we saw essentially no difference or no difference between each of the grades of view, kind of obviating its success in those difficult airways. And then there was this whole narrative about, well, Hennepin is this awesome center of excellence, which has really high first pass success. That's because they train with the bougie from day one. So they have all this experience. But you know, in the supplemental data, we actually saw that either you had a ton of even the operators with a bunch of previous intubations did not have a benefit with stylet versus bougie. And we also saw specifically operators with a bougie experience, you know, 10 or greater, again, didn't have a significant difference between first pass success. And we actually saw that the stylet had a trend towards being better. Okay, but let's like get into like the statistical analysis and the nuts and bolts. They excluded a bunch of patients who the operator thought they had an indication for the bougie. Obviously that's gonna skew our results. And this was a narrative I heard, but there was only 12 of the 548 uh, where the operator actually felt this was absolutely indicated. So that's not that many and it's not enough to sway the results of this trial. And so then I was thinking, well, you know what? Let me get into this supplemental data, right? The answer is going to be there. I'm still going to have this validation. So Hennepin crushed it, right? And I'm looking at all of the sites that were done. And unfortunately, you know, Hennepin ED was not a study site. And that's why I gleaned from the supplemental data. I'm waiting for someone to correct me. And so unfortunately, we don't have the influence of that study site into the entire results. So we don't see Hennepin ICU was, but we don't see any particular ED or ICU really shining above the rest. So when I think about this and I think about my early infatuation, and I know I've had anecdotal experience with the bougie being a major impact in the care of my patients, then what's the real problem? And the real problem is that this was a well done study, it's a pragmatic trial answering a very important question. And so while I personally was felt defeated, you know, I was in mourning for months over this, the real problem is that I was disappointed. Um, the silver lining, of course, is that we still have our single site study, uh, the BEAM trial by Brian Driver in Hennepin showing some amazing results. So I know there is this shot for excellence that we all can strive for. And along these lines, I really advocate for people to keep track of what is your personal first pass success? What is your first pass success in difficult airways? And how can you improve that? Because we know that there is this goal of obtaining a 99% first pass success. And of course, as providers, we should all really be striving for that. Again, my name is Taryn Trott. Thank you guys so much. Thank <laughs> you.